Um, once again, the objectives for this training are to create an awareness of human rights and advocacy and care of the earth. And another objective is to bring about a change of mindset from a charity or service model to a rights-based model of operating. We also hope that this training will create an advocacy networking platform where participants can learn from one another, share their experiences, collaborate with and support one another. So today's, um, the theme of today's presentation is ERI's engagement with the human rights system. And Terry will be conducting this uh, session of the training. So with that, I'm going to uh, hand over to Brian. Brian, over to you, Brian. Okay, thanks, Tito. So, a warm welcome to everyone on behalf of the members of the ERI team to this, the second of our training webinars. This one is an introduction to the UN human rights mechanisms with which ERI and our partners engage. And those mechanisms are the Universal Periodic Review, the UN Special Procedures and Treaty Bodies. Our presenter today is Brother Terry Dowling, Terry is a member of the ERI team in Geneva. He joined the brothers in South Africa in 1961. He trained as a science and mathematics teacher, and he taught in Edmund Rice schools in Bloemfontein, Kimberley, Springs, and Welcome, where he also served as the headmaster. He later taught in a rural teacher's college before being appointed to the leadership team of the Southern African province and served as the province leader from 1997 to 2002. He worked with refugees for a number of years then while continuing to teach science. From 2011 to 2021, he was the director of the Christian Brothers Eco Spirituality Center at Stellenbosch, hosting many youth and adult groups, as well as individuals. And then he joined the uh, ERI team here in Geneva in 2021. 2022, sorry. Uh, Terry has a love of the outdoors and a particular interest in the care of the earth and the spirituality that underlies this. So, well, with that introduction, I'll hand over to you, Terry, for your presentation on the UN human rights mechanisms. So that is a picture of the the hall where the Human Rights Council meets at the UN headquarters here in Geneva. And we're going to discuss the, the universal periodic review process. It's a process where states review states. So what is the UPR? It was created in 2007 by a resolution of the Human Rights Council and implemented for the first time in April 2008. The 47 members, state members of the Human Rights Council review the human rights situation of each United Nations member state. The aim of the process is to ensure all member states of the United Nations are reviewed equally and transparently by other member states in a cooperative dialogue. So it is a unique process that reviews the human rights records of all 193 UN member states. It gives all states an opportunity to demonstrate actions taken to improve the human rights situation. It gives the UN a chance to address human rights violations and to help states deal with human rights challenges. It reminds states of their responsibility to fully respect all human rights and fundamental freedoms. So the UPR process and its goals, first of all, it's universal. 
all 193 member states of the United Nations are reviewed on an equal basis. And this whole process of re reviewing all these states takes place over four and a half years. The review, the performance in human rights obligations, all human rights are given equal attention. <clears throat> so the objectives, the improvement of the human rights situation on the ground, the fulfillment of the state's human rights obligations and commitments, an assessment of positive developments and challenges <clears throat> to enhance the state's capacity and technical assistance, sharing of good practices, encouraging full cooperation and engagement with the Human Rights Council, human rights bodies, and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. So who conducts the review? The reviews are conducted by the 47 elected members of the Human Rights Council, and they form the working group. The other UN member states participate in the discussion as observer states. So a question you might think about is why is this review known as a peer review? Now we're going to just show you a little video on the UPR process. The Universal Periodic Review or UPR is one of the most accessible human rights mechanisms of the United Nations Human Rights Council. It's a useful tool for human rights defenders, and the reason is right there in the name. It is universal, covering all 193 states and all human rights, civil, political, economic, social, and cultural. It is periodic, meaning that the process is regular and predictable, with each stage reviewed approximately every five years. And it is a peer review process, where other states can make recommendations to your country on its human rights progress. The scope and breadth of the UPR means that you, as a human rights defender, can use it to raise awareness of the human rights situation in your country and to hold states accountable. Although the UPR process is led by states, you can take part at every stage in a variety of ways. Before the review. The review is based on information submitted in national, UN and civil society reports. By contributing to these reports, you can influence the content and course of the review itself. For example, you might participate in a national consultation or lobby your government directly to make sure they include your concerns in the official state report. You can also prepare your own civil society report highlighting the most pressing human rights issues in your country. And you don't have to do this alone. Working with partners and other civil society actors can help amplify your voice and impact. You could also use a UPR pre-session to meet with delegates from other states and encourage them to raise certain issues. This is particularly effective because the states conducting the review do not necessarily know the human rights situation on the ground. During the review. The review itself happens in Geneva and takes the form of an interactive dialogue. This is where reports are considered and states make their recommendations. The state under review can then either accept the recommendations or note them. While only representatives of member states are permitted to speak during the interactive dialogue, you can still follow the session and raise awareness of proceedings through the media. When the UPR outcome report is later presented for adoption by the Human Rights Council, you have the option to make an oral statement. 
This can be a good opportunity to highlight issues raised during the UPR. <clears throat> After the review. It might seem that once a review in Geneva is finished, then it's all over for the next five years. But that's not the case. Your country is expected to implement the recommendations it has received before the next review. By publicizing the recommendations and engaging in advocacy, you can help keep the focus on their implementation. You can also monitor progress by producing a UPR midterm report. Each and every country in the world has a responsibility to protect human rights. Through the Universal Periodic Review, human rights defenders can ensure states abide by human rights standards, live up to their commitments, and promote and protect the rights of all. So that video gave you an overview of the UPR process. Now we'll go through it again in the, the following slides. So the first stage is the preparation of the three reports. The report by the state, which is 20 pages long, the report by the UN bodies, which is 10 pages long, and then a summary report of all submissions from civil society, NGOs, organizations, which is 10 pages long. We'll come back to those later. These reports are prepared at least six months prior to the review and are published about a month before the review takes place. The second stage is the review itself. And this is an interactive dialogue. Each state is given three and a half hours. The state under review speaks to its report and then member states can raise issues and recommendations in response to that report. A report is prepared and accepted at the end of this process, and then it's given to the state to interact with it. The state then takes that report, and at the next Human Rights Council, it comes to the, adopt, the third phase, which the, is the adoption phase, or the outcomes phase. The state, uh, this, this uh, adoption phase takes one hour and the state submits a report where it shows where it has accepted or supported recommendations of all the other states or it has just noted these recommendations. So it can accept or support recommendations or just note recommendations. And sometimes there's over 200 recommendations by the different states. The states themselves are given an opportunity to raise issues and respond to this report in the third phase. And also NGOs and civil society organizations like Edmund Rice International can make an oral submission or statement on issues and on the recommendations and make their own recommendations to the state. At the end of this adoption phase, the Human Rights Council accepts the, whole, accepts the whole report and that is tabled. And then the state takes that away. So now it's the, the fourth phase is the next four and a half years. And here it's where human rights organizations, NGOs, civil society organizations, can follow up on what the state has accepted or supported and monitor progress. Very often at the third phase, states uh, would uh, commit themselves to submitting a midterm report. So NGO organizations can follow up and see whether the state does submit a midterm report on progress on what it has submitted and what it has undertaken to do. So that gives you an idea of the whole four phases of the UPR process. Now, the next slide shows you how a UPR cycle goes. 
one cycle takes four and a half years. And the fourth cycle of the UPR process started in Geneva in November last year. There are three sessions a year, and in each session, 14 states are reviewed, each for three and a half hours through interactive dialogue. So if you do the arithmetic and there are three sessions a year, then 42 states are reviewed during one year. And then to get through all 193 states will take four and a half years. And then the process starts to repeat itself. So we, have, we are in the midst of the fourth cycle. In, the, in November last year, four countries that were of interest to Edmund Rice International were, were reviewed. That was India, South Africa, the UK and Northern Ireland and the Philippines. So where can NGOs participate in this whole process? First of all, stage one is where the compilation of the reports takes place. So you can put input, give input into the national report, the compilation of the UN report, or submit UPR statements as an NGO. These have to be well researched and submitted at least six months prior to the review. All NGO statements then are compilated into a 10-page uh, summary document that is, or, that is uh, compiled by the UN. And that is published at least one month before the review. And you can go in and read this report and see whether any of your recommendations in your submission have been, com have been caught up in this compilation or the summary document. So we did that for all four of the states, the India, South Africa, United, United Kingdom and Northern Ireland and the Philippines before the November session last year. Now, prior to the review session, about one month before, there is a pre-UPR session where NGOs come and speak and states participate. And we go to this session and we take a summary of our submission of these particular countries, just about one page long with a couple of recommendations. And we go and advocate or lobby with various states to see whether they can include in their recommendations, our recommendations. We can also make, take, uh, make appointments with state uh, some, with various states uh, here in Geneva and see whether we can get them to adopt our recommendations. So that's a pre-session advocacy thing. During the, the review session, an NGO or a civil society organization like Edmund Rice International can only observe and monitor the review process. Then we come to the, uh, the third phase, which is the adoption session. And here, uh, NGOs and civil society organizations can make an oral statement in uh, looking at what uh, uh, recommendations states have supported or noted and making our own issues prevalent pre uh, to the state under review. Then it comes to the fourth phase where there's awareness raising and monitoring of progress that the state has undertaken to do. So that gives you an idea where NGOs and civil society organizations can be involved in this whole process. So now we're going to just go to an oral statement at the outcomes phase of India. And this was given by Brother Tino. This was an in-person one in the Human Rights Council. And now for a joint statement, I give the floor to the representative of Edmund Rice International. Mr. Vice President, 
Edmund Rice International, Vides and Prathik commence the constructive participation of India in its fourth UPR. Concerning children at risk of separation and in need of alternative care, we welcome the acceptance of Recommendation 151.305 and highlight the importance of reintegrating children and families whenever possible. We welcome the acceptance of Recommendations 151.256, 279 and 285. However, we are concerned about the increase of child marriages and teen pregnancy during the pandemic and recommend that India reconstitute village and neighborhood level child protection committees to monitor and address child labor, child marriage, child trafficking and sexual abuse. We regret that recommendations 151.203 and 204 were only noted as the pandemic has worsened critical educational issues as shown by low enrollment, high dropout rates and shortage of qualified teachers, especially in rural areas. We urge India to make mental health education and counselors mandatory in all schools and embed the education of the SDGs into the school curriculum. We urgently call on India to effectively implement the right to free and Compulsory Education Act, ensuring consistency of states' legal frameworks. We welcome the acceptance of Recommendation 151.35 and urge India to delay no further and appear for its treaty body review before the Committee on the Rights of the Child. We welcome the acceptance of Recommendations 151.37 and 38 and urge India to fix dates for the visit of the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Obligations and the Environment. We call on the state to declare climate emergency and reverse the weakening of laws, practices and institutions that protect the environment. Finally, we urge India to engage children in reviewing the national policy for children and include their environmental rights in the same. Thank you. Thank you. So that gives you an idea of an oral response at the outcomes of the UPR for India. And you can see Brother Tino is interacting with uh, recommendations that were supported and noted and highlighting issues. So now, I'll go. can everybody see that? Yes, Derek. Okay. So we're going to discuss treaty bodies now, one of the other mechanism, mechanisms of the United Nations. So treaty bodies are committees of independent experts that monitor implementation of the core international human rights treaties. A treaty, convention, or covenant is an, an international legal instrument. A treaty imposes binding legal obligations upon a state that is a party to that treaty. A state becomes a party to a treaty by ratifying it which means the state voluntarily decides to be bound by its provisions, hence the term state party. The state therefore becomes obligated under international law to uphold and implement the provisions of the treaty. And this implies that the domestic legislation of the state party must be in conformity with the provisions of the treaty and cannot contradict them in any way. So once a state has signed up to a treaty, it's got to bring its domestic legislation in line with what the treaty requires. So United Nations treaties or covenants adopted in 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, UDHR, elaborated upon and systematized for the first time the idea of human rights derived from the United Nations or UN Charter. The UDHR enumerated a variety of civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights that were subsequently separated and incorporated into two binding treaties. The first, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, 1966, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, 1966. 
and the UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and these two covenants together form the minimum standard of international human rights protection known as the International Bill of Rights. And then various other treaties came into existence. The Human Rights Committee that deals with civil and political rights, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the Committee Against Torture, the Committee on the Rights of the Child, the Committee on the Protection of Migrant Workers, the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the Committee on Enforced Disappearances. It might be interesting to see what you are interested in. Edmund Rice International is very interested in the Committee on the Rights of the Child, the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, and the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So what do the treaty bodies do? So <clears throat> all treaty bodies are committees that receive and consider reports submitted by the state parties. They hold meetings with the state parties in person or online, for example, during the COVID pandemic. They issue concluding observations recommendations to assist states in implementing their obligations. They develop general comments or recommendations interpreting provisions of their respective treaties. Some treaty bodies may perform additional functions such as consider individual communications, conduct or initiate inquiries, conduct investigations through country visits. And here is where civil society organizations can get involved with the treaty bodies. So we're gonna just show you a little video on treaty bodies. Things don't have rights. People do. For example, we have the right to education, to express ourselves freely, to be protected from violence. These rights are written down in international treaties. Governments sign up to these treaties on behalf of their people. There are 10 core treaties protecting people's rights. Some focus on children, women, persons with disabilities, migrant workers. By signing these treaties, your government promises to respect these rights. Governments don't always keep their promises. And it can be difficult for people to check up on their government. So each treaty is monitored by a group of independent experts from all over the world. These experts come together to work in committees called United Nations Human Rights Treaty Bodies. The experts get information from many sources. The government, of course, but also civil society organizations and individuals. The treaty bodies then question governments in detail about their human rights record. They then report their findings and make recommendations for action. 
bodies also address cases where individuals have suffered a miscarriage of justice. The treaty body's recommendations are made public on the UN Human Rights Office website and social media feeds. If your country has been reviewed, you can use these recommendations to encourage the government to take action. You have the right to claim your rights. Use the treaty body's findings to help you. When the treaty bodies question your government about your rights, you can watch the session on this website. Hold your government to account. Make sure they're doing their job. So that's an overview of the treaty bodies and a question for your consideration. Which of the UN treaties are most relevant to your involvement in advocacy and human rights? So look at those lists and see which ones you might get involved with. We now move on to United Nations Special Procedures. So, Special Procedures, they can be independent human rights experts tasked by the UN to investigate and report on human rights situations around the world. And Special Procedures can be independent experts or they can be a working group, or they can be an individual special rapporteur. There are 14 country mandates, special rapporteurs on the situation of human rights in, for example, Afghanistan, in Myanmar, in Belarus, in 14 different countries around the world. There are also thematic mandates, 44 of them, this, for example, the Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights in the Context of Climate Change, the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion, the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Education, and so on. There are 44 thematic mandates. The Special Procedures allows a precise focus on an issue. They are fast, flexible, and public. They are open and accessible. The cases they raise, the countries they visit, and even the content of their reports are all strongly influenced by information they receive from civil society. Special procedures embark on country visits, prepare reports, and raise concerns about individual cases or laws. Special procedures can also issue statements and press releases, thereby increasing awareness of a human rights problem. So again, a short little video on special procedures. When the Human Rights Council decides a rights issue is so important that it needs a specialist investigation, it creates a special procedure. Through special procedures, human rights defenders can draw attention to rights abuses and prompt an expert-led response. Special procedures come in different shapes and sizes. They can be an individual, known as a special rapporteur or independent expert, or a team of experts called working groups. In all cases, these experts are entirely independent. Not controlled by politics, they remain impartial and unbiased. This neutrality allows them to cover issues that might otherwise be deemed too politically sensitive for discussion at the international level. Special procedures can have a thematic scope. For example, the Working Group on Enforced Disappearances was created as a reaction to that particular human rights violation and examines the issue in every country around the world. Other special procedures focus on a single country, 
such as the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Cambodia. They embark on country visits, prepare reports, and raise concerns about individual cases or laws. Every year, the experts present their reports to the Human Rights Council. The reports include recommendations to the Council, to individual governments, and to other actors, like businesses or NGOs. Special procedures can also issue statements and press releases, thereby increasing scrutiny or awareness of a problem. Special procedures are one of the most powerful international instruments for confronting violations of the rights of individuals and particular groups. In the past, they have taken action against the killing of environmentalists, raised awareness of the challenges facing women human rights defenders, shone a light on abuses against LGBTI people, and helped to expose the risks faced by civil society in highly restrictive environments. So as a mechanism, Special procedures are invaluable to human rights defenders. Their defined scope allows a precise focus on the issue. They are fast, flexible and public. They can mobilize quickly as situations arise and react as they develop. Finally, they are open and accessible. The cases they raise, the countries they visit and even the content of their reports are all strongly influenced by information they receive from civil society. As a result, special procedures are one of the most effective tools available to human rights defenders. So, every year the experts present their reports to the Human Rights Council. And these reports include recommendations to the Council, to individual governments, and to businesses and NGOs. So now we'll move on to the Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council is a forum empowered to prevent abuses, inequity, and discrimination, protect the most vulnerable, and expose perpetrators. The Council is composed of 47 elected United Nations member states, and this intergovernmental body meets in Geneva in March, June, and September each year. This is over and above the UPR sessions. Only NGOs with consultative status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC, can participate in the Human Rights Council sessions as observers. They can address the Council during interactive discussions and debates, thus highlighting human rights violations around the globe. As observers, NGOs are able, amongst other things, to attend and observe proceedings of the Council, submit written statements to the Human Rights Council, make oral interventions to the Human Rights Council. So in March this year, Human Rights Council met for its 52nd session. And ERI participated in this and delivered 16 oral interventions and highlighting human rights situations around the globe on behalf of our advocacy partners. Interventions at the Human Rights Council are opportunities to highlight and bring to the attention of the Human Rights Council and your state one or more of the following. The UPR recommendations that your state has approved, treaty body and special procedure recommendations made to your state, a human rights issue that you or your project are actively engaged with, a human rights violation that you are addressing or are concerned about. And during a Human Rights Council session, Edmund Rice International has opportunities to participate in debates, interactive dialogues, panel discussions, and informal meetings. And during the 52nd session, there was an annual full day discussion on the rights of the child, panel discussion on human rights mainstreaming and on the death penalty, debates on the elimination of racial discrimination 
and on the rights of persons with disabilities. And we participated in all these. So during a Human Rights Council session, ERI has opportunities to participate in interactive dialogues, debates, panel discussions, and informal meetings. Now we're going to give you an example of some of these interactive dialogues. So we had a few thematic dialogues on the reports of special rapporteurs, one being the human rights and the environment, and the other being housing, and one a special rapporteur on a country like Myanmar. We gave oral uh, submissions on the UPR outcomes of South Africa, India, United Kingdom, and North and Northern Ireland, and the Philippines. You've already listened to the outcomes report by Brother Tino on India. So we're going to play for you uh, a, a, a report or an oral statement on housing in Northern Ireland. And this was delivered, delivered by a, a gentleman who was experiencing homelessness. So we'll take that one now. Video, the distinguished representative for a joint statement by Vivat International and Edmund Rice International Limited. Mr. President, the UK government is failing to effectively address the needs of people experiencing homelessness in Northern Ireland and their right to adequate housing. Housing is a basic human right, but Northern Ireland is in the midst of a housing and homelessness crisis. On the 31st of December 2022, there were over 44,500 applicants on the social housing waiting list. Almost 24,500 households on the social housing waiting list have homelessness status. That's more than 3% of all households living in Northern Ireland today. On May the 1st, 2022, 8,500 people were living in temporary accommodation. In some cases, people are waiting for more than five years to get a permanent home. Families were the highest category of homelessness acceptances in 2021-22. Almost 3,500 families were accepted as homeless. Between July 2021 and June 2022, nearly 6,700 children were accepted as homeless. As someone with, with lived experience of rough sleeping and the traumatic impact of homelessness to my personal well-being, I believe that everyone needs and deserves a permanent home. BVAT International and Edmund Rice International recommends that the government significantly increases the supply of safe, secure and affordable housing for all in Northern Ireland, including the private rental sector, and work across government departments to focus on homelessness prevention rather than homelessness management. Thank you. Thank you. Thanking again all of you for your very sincere and constructive engagement. Uh, and let me also briefly point out that um, my next report um, to the General Assembly is actually going to be on the topic of affordability, a topic of great interest for not just uh, emerging economies and poor countries, for example, countries that have a large number of informal settlements, but also rich countries, as we heard from the submission of Vivat International and such other NGOs. A very large number of people remain unhoused and have a lack of and suffer from lack of adequate housing in rich countries. And uh, the current ongoing multiple intersecting crises, which are, you know, the climate crisis along with security and other crises have actually made it extremely challenging for um, uh, countries to address the question of affordability. And I hope. So that gives you an idea of uh, an oral submission on housing in Northern Ireland, and also the response of the special rapporteur, where he remarked on the submission by Vivet and Edmund Rice International, that even rich countries have a homelessness situation that they've got to deal with. Just forgot to tell you that this statement was by video. And now the one on Myanmar is also by video and that is given by Brother Brian Bond. I call on the representative of Edmund Rice International Limited. Mr. President, because of the ongoing violence in the crisis zones of Myanmar, many people have left their villages and live in the forests. Their most needed help concerns food, medical services, and education. 
The World Food Programme provides good quality food, but the military sells the rice and keeps the profit for themselves, with poor quality rice then distributed to people in the cities. Food from the World Food Programme does not reach the people in the conflict zones or the internally displaced persons living in the forest because transportation is blocked by the military. Local people who want to help buy rice at a very high price and then have to find a way of transporting it into the conflict zones and the forests. The IDPs do not receive medical help, they have nothing to eat and children receive no education. Children in the conflict zones have stopped going to school. Many teachers and medical professionals have stopped work as part of the civil disobedience movement. The military has employed unqualified people to teach, thereby impacting the quality of education. Soldiers wait for children in front of schools, allegedly to protect them, but children are afraid as they are often taken from the streets and forced to fight as soldiers. We recommend that the World Food Programme find ways to provide food in the conflict zones. Medical and education services also need support and protection. We ask the members of the Council to condemn in the strongest terms the massive and grave human rights violations taking place in Myanmar. Thank you. Merci. So I'll hand back to you, Tina. So the reason that we uh, wanted to today share with you the UN human rights mechanisms is so that you might find ways to engage with them, just like we, uh, we at ERI do. So to do that, okay, um, first you need to um, identify what is your human rights area of focus. Once you've identified your human rights area of focus, or uh, it could be even of interest, then next identify the treaty body committee or identify the special procedure that works in this area of focus and that and you would like to engage with. So just to give you an example, if your human rights area focuses rights of children, that's a big focus of ERI, then the treaty body committee that you would want to engage with would be the committee on the rights of the child. You, you might also want to engage with other ones, but this would be a central one. And a special procedure that you would want to engage with would be the special rapporteur on the right to education. There are other special rapporteurs also that you could uh, that you could engage with, but this would be the main one. If your human rights area focuses rights of women, then the treaty body committee you might want to engage with would be CEDAW or the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. And the special procedure that you would want to engage with, engage with uh, might be the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and Girls, or the Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls. So the first thing is, once, uh, once um, I... Um, once I have identified my human rights area of focus, then I can identify also the treaty body as well as the special procedure that I would like to engage with. Next, go to the OHCHR site and do some research over there on the treaty body committee. Do some research over there on the special procedure that you want to engage with. Also on the OHCHR site, you will find when your state is being reviewed by, let us say, uh, CEDAW, or when your state is coming up next for the UPR, the Universal Periodic Review, and also on the site, you can check how you can engage with, this, with these UN human rights mechanisms. So now I'm going to take you to the OHCHR's website, okay?
Okay, so this is the OHCHR, the United Nations Human Rights Office of the High Commissioner. This is the website. And for those working on advocacy, I think this is the most important website. All right. Over here, there, is, there are lots of topics that you can research and you can find out more about human rights, advocacy, and how you can uh, engage with mechanisms. If you look at this particular tab, instruments and mechanisms, we're going to go down to treaty bodies. I'm going to click on treaty bodies. Okay, and it opens a whole new page on treaty bodies and on in the left on the le in the left hand column over there you see an overview of treaty bodies meetings and deadlines lots of information and on the right hand side over here what are the treaty bodies okay and um, the uh, committee on the elimination of racial discrimination the human rights committee committee on the elimination of discrimination against women Okay, CEDAW, and there's more information. So I'm going to click on more information. And therefore, and this opens the page on the committee on, uh, on the elimination of discrimination against women. And here you find out what are some of their key documents. Okay, and also you'll find out the calendar of country reviews and documentation deadlines. So if you click on this particular tab over here, this is what you'll come up with. Okay, and here you've got all these different options. Okay, so I have set it for the Asia Pacific region and I've set it for India. So when was India last reviewed by CEDAW? Okay, if we go down here, we'll see the submitted date. Okay, the last time India was reviewed was maybe in 2012. That was the last time it was reviewed. And on this, if you click on any of these, um, um, okay, no, not here. Uh, you don't get the reports here. But another tab will give you actually the state party's report, will also give you uh, the state party's report on follow-up to concluding observations. Now this, okay, after each review, as uh, you're aware, after uh, Terry's presentation, okay, the committee, CEDAW would... Um, would deliver the concluding observations and and then the state party is expected to report on their follow-up to these concluding uh, observations now you see india's report was due by 2016 but it has not been submitted as of today and india's next review was due on uh, in 2018, the state party's re report was due. Only when the state party's report is received by the committee, in this case CEDAW, can the review cycle start. If the state party does not uh, submit its report, CEDAW's hands are tied and they cannot have a review, right? So, um, and do remember that all these reviews are voluntary. There's no compulsion, but because India has ratified uh, see the, the treaty, okay? Therefore, it, it is encouraged, okay? Every four and a half, five to six years to submit a report and to submit itself for a review, okay? This was due in 2018. Till today, the report has not been submitted and therefore the review has not been held. So it's over 10 years now since India was last reviewed by uh, CEDAW. That just gives you an idea, okay? Now, 
I'm going to move. So you can go over here to instruments and mechanisms and you can find out about any treaty body that you're interested in. Or you can go to special procedures, okay? And click on special procedures. And now this website opens about special procedures. And here you see an overview, an introduction, and the thematic mandates, okay? And you see that there are 45 thematic mandates and country mandates, there are 14 country mandates. I think during the last UP, uh, during the last um, HRC session, which was uh, in March, one of these thematic mandates was not renewed. And so instead of 45, now there are 44. I'm just going to click on this link over here, the thematic mandates, okay? And, um, okay, and here you see all these 45 uh, mandates over here, all right? The one I'm going to click on over here is education. And if you click on that, you go to uh, the website of the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Education. All right, and once again here, the purpose of the mandate, about the mandate, and who's the current mandate holder? It happens to be Ms. Farida Shaheed from Pakistan, and she was appointed a special rapporteur on the right to education in 2022. Now, if I go up over here again, all right, to the left-hand column, you see country visits. So I'll just click on country visits. Special rapporteurs try to make at least two country visits every year. Of course, during the pandemic, they were not able to do that. And here you will see the past um, uh, country visits uh, along with the reports, the press release and the end of the mission statement, okay, uh, of the special rapporteur. So you see that the last country visit was in 2019 to Qatar, okay. So I'm just showing you these so that um, yeah, you know where to go and what you're looking for. I'm just going to stop sharing over here, or maybe I'll just start a new share. Okay, just go back to that. Okay, right. So that is how you can engage with the treaty bodies and with the special rapporteurs. If you want to engage with the Human Rights Council, you're aware now that all special rapporteurs report annually to the Human Rights Council. And ECOSOC accredited NGOs like ERI have an opportunity to engage by delivering an oral statement. You saw a couple of those oral statements, right? If so what you have to now do is find out during which session of the Human Rights Council, because you know during one of these three sessions in March, June, and September, the Special Rapporteur's report is due. So find out during which session your particular human right, uh, special rapporteur's report is due. For example, the Special Rapporteur on Housing, Mr. Balakrishnan Raja Gopal, delivered his annual report to the Human Rights Council during the 52nd HRC in March. And so, um, and then you, in response, as part of that interactive dialogue, you saw uh, the person from Northern Ireland experiencing homelessness, okay? Um, I think his name was Edward, okay? Delivering a statement on behalf of Edmund Rice International. Okay, so um, these statements can only be delivered by ECOSOC accredited NGOs. Okay, so if you do not belong to an uh, ECOSOC accredited NGO, then you need to try and collaborate with one. Okay, so that your concerns and uh, are, can be reflected then. Uh, at the UN, at the Human Rights Council, at the Human Rights Council. Now you don't need to be an uh, ECOSOC uh, accredited NGO to engage with treaty bodies. 
or with the special rapporteur. You don't need to be uh, ECOSOC accredited NGOs. Only if you want to deliver statements at the Human Rights Council, then you have to be. So I hope that is a little clearer over there. Yeah, one of the main questions was what measures can the UN take to hold countries to report when they're meant to report? And as Tino said, it is a voluntary thing. So there's no uh, big stick there, but naming and shaming a country can, can work. Um, so that, that, that's one of the areas I think uh, where the Human Rights Council does try its best. I don't know what else you've noted, Brian, that you can come in. Sure. Um, perhaps just uh, address a couple of questions. One there was, uh, has the UPR been effective and, and how do we measure its effectiveness? And I'd say, yes, it has been effective to an extent. It's, it's not perfect by any means. Um, it's politicised. Uh, countries can criticise enemies. Think of India and Pakistan when they get the chance to speak uh, about each other. Um, others perhaps go soft on their friends and hope that that will be reciprocated. Um, some of the recommendations that are made are very vague, like, you know, continue to work to improve uh, access to education. That's pretty hard to, well, it's pretty easy to say that you're doing something, but it mightn't be very much. Um, some countries deny that uh, problems exist and uh, have um, great restrictions on, on civil society, which limits the effectiveness. Um, but I think a big problem is, is one of implementation, and that's where I think everybody ha has an important role because, uh, I mean, how many people that you know are even aware that your country has been reviewed at the UPR? So even just to raise awareness about these mechanisms and the reviews that take place can be a very important step because the more that people... Uh, aware that the government has accepted certain responsibilities, then uh, they're better placed to hold the government to account. And uh, the other thing I'd just say is that countries, uh, as Terry referred to, don't like to be criticised or embarrassed uh, internationally. Um, how do you measure the effectiveness? I guess if recommendations are implemented, then that's uh, a measure of their success. But I think um, what happens with the UPR is because there's another cycle in four and a half years, countries don't like to appear and uh, hear that, you know, they didn't implement the recommendations they accepted at the previous uh, review. So that can be uh, something that works in, in, um, in, in favour. And just a quick comment about the treaty bodies. Yes, one of the um, weaknesses of the treaty body system is uh, if, if countries fail to submit reports. Usually they eventually do, but as we saw in the case that Tino highlighted with India, um, uh, it's been quite a while. Um, and the special procedures, um, it's great if they can get to visit a country, but some countries won't welcome visits and, uh, and the special rapporteurs require an invitation. In any case, even if they did, it would take them 100 years to visit every country. So um, there's a limitation there in the visits, but uh, still the special rapporteurs give their reports, they gather information, they get information sent to them and um, urgent appeals and that sort of thing. So the statements and the reports that they make can, ma can make a difference and can be effective. So I'll leave it at that. There's just a, a comment about a couple of questions. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And thank you very much, Terry, for the presentations today. And uh, Brian, if you'd like to share uh, your comments on any of the uh, questions that came up. Okay, thanks, Tino. Yes, I'll, I'll try and respond to a number of those questions. There was a question about Human Rights Council membership. And yes, members are elected for three years. And there's a, a regional balance. Um, so there are 13 countries from Africa, 13 from the Asia Pacific, eight from Latin America and the Caribbean, etc. So it's a proportional sort of representation. There was a question there about whether challenges could prevent implementation of UPR recommendations. I think if a country doesn't feel that they can implement 
um, a recommendation, they will note it rather than uh, say that they will accept it. And some countries will note recommendations, but uh, will actually implement them. Uh, where, where that's been our experience, but they probably uh, would try to be cautious because they don't want to say that they will implement something and then not be able to do it. But having said that, unexpected challenges can arise and, and prevent implementation. There was a question about Russia. And, um, the Human Rights Council had a special debate about Russia with following the invasion of Ukraine, and uh, it passed a resolution with the vast majority of countries condemning the invasion. Um, interestingly, Russia is going to be reviewed as part of the UPR in November of this year. So uh, it will be interesting to see what recommendations are put forward, given the um, uh, situation in Russia, NGOs in Russia are not going to be able to make any submissions that are critical of, of the country, but enough uh, other countries would be aware of the situation and will be uh, able to make recommendations relating to freedom of the press, suppression of uh, free speech and human rights defenders, etc. I, I would I would expect. And I suppose that, uh, I, I mean, I don't expect that uh, Russia will um, accept any of those recommendations. And I guess that's one of the limitations of the process that uh, uh, nobody can force a country to accept a recommendation. And even uh, countries can claim to implement recommendations and yet uh, uh, NGOs can know very well that, they, uh, that what they say is not really accurate. So that's one of the limitations. There are there are other limitations. Um, I mean, it's not perfect system at all. It's effective up to a point, but uh, it's politicised. Uh, when you get uh, India making recommendations regarding Pakistan or vice versa or Cuba in the United States, um, uh, then you can see examples of uh, politicisation in action. Um, some countries can be relaxed reluctant to imply a criticism of another due to their economic dependence on that country. Um, some countries will go soft on their friends and hope that that's reciprocated when, when it's their turn to be reviewed. Um, some recommendations are very vague, like continue efforts to improve access to education. It's pretty easy for a country to point to something that they're doing that would uh, claim to be um, addressing that, even though it mightn't be uh, particularly effective. Um, so um, it's true that, uh, too, that in many countries, there's a limited opportunity for NGOs to make uh, 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 submit reports and the report of the country, the national report, can very often not reflect reality. But hopefully that's not the situation in, in your country. And, and um, I think countries can be sensitive to criticism. They can genuinely want to try and implement or improve the human rights situation of their citizens. And uh, they don't want to turn up for the next review in four or five years and find that uh, and be criticized for not implementing the recommendations that were made at the previous review. So I think that's an important incentive for them to, to do something. And I think there's an important role for everyone in all of this, and that's to raise awareness about these procedures. I mean, with the people that you work with, I wonder how many are aware that their country is even being reviewed. So a simple step that you can all do is to raise awareness about these procedures. And there was just one other comment that I'll... Uh, Somebody asked, why is it that, you know, with countries committed to human rights, supposedly that so many people are killed every day? And I think that's a very good question. And um, the sad reality is that a lot of countries play lip service to human rights. But if their leaders uh, uh, or governments are preoccupied with their own power and wealth, then uh, uh, those um, human rights considerations uh, can be um, uh, not taken into account or not given the priority that they deserve. 
So there's just a response to a number of the questions that uh, 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 I, see, I see there. And, you know, I see there's another comment being made. There's a lot of frustration when we see violence, killing wars in the world today, even though when we have all these international laws, treaties and conventions. And, 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 that, and that's very true. And, and uh, it comes down to the problem of enforcing these things. It's, uh, and, uh, and that's where there's the role for, I think, um, civil society and NGOs to hold governments to account to ensure that they, as far as possible, comply with their obligations in all of those things. So I'll leave it at that, Tina. Okay, thanks, thanks, Brian. Terry, would you like to add anything? Oh, no, nothing really. Brian has covered most of it. There was one other question. What happens to countries that don't sign the treaties? Uh, well, they encourage to do so on a regular basis, but they don't have to if they don't want to. But there yes. is the UPR process. Yeah, and if they don't sign a treaty, then they uh, then a, tree, a, a committee cannot call them for a review. Yeah. They do not come for a review. So I thank just, you. Yes, Brian. Just, right, one comment to that. Um, I was at the Human Rights Council when a small Pacific Island state said that they would like to sign a treaty, but they didn't because simply they didn't have the capacity within their public service network to comply with all the reporting requirements of the UN, that uh, they're a very small country and couldn't afford to employ more, uh, uh, more people to do that. And I think that's prob probably true because the reporting demands of the UN, if they ratify all the treaties and the UPR and uh, all of that, it can be very demanding. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Brian.